Guess what, Lions? For as little as $5 a month, you can get access to exclusive bonus audio content and help this program grow by joining the Lions of Liberty Pride. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash support. I care about people, and, and, and to care about people, you've got to care about free markets. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Row! Row, roar, roar. Yeah, that's right. I'm back to full health, my friends. Thank you so much for the letters, the cards, the uh, Facebook messages, the tweets. Most of those didn't even happen. You guys didn't seem that concerned about me, but I guess I made it through a whole podcast last week, so everyone thought I was fine, and I was fine. I made it, but now I am back at my full liberty strength, excited to bring you this 337th edition of the original, the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast going on. Very close to five years here. About four and a half years I've been doing this show myself before I brought on my compatriots, Brian McWilliams, who has his show, of course, every single Wednesday, Electric Liberty Land, your weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty, as well as my buddy John Odermatt, who wraps things up for you every single Friday with his hard-hitting look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. That's why you got to hit that darn subscribe button, folks, because you don't want to miss a thing. A lot of variety going on here at Lions of Liberty. Today, I'm going to have a great, interesting interview for you. And to be sure you can keep track of things, I want to give you a little tip to head over to today's show notes, which you can find over at lionsofliberty.com slash 337. Enough futzing around. Let's get into today's show. <laughs> My guest today is the former economics editor at Barron's, where he is also currently a contributor there as well as elsewhere, where he writes about economic issues. He is also the director of the Soho Forum in New York City, which features debates on many topics relevant to libertarians. You may have heard his appearances on several other libertarian podcasts, including The Tom Woods Show and Part of the Problem with Dave Smith. I'm very pleased to welcome Gene Epstein. Gene, are you ready to roar? I think so. I think you are. <laughs> and now, Gene, you know, I brought you on today to discuss something specific. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Donald Trump's proposed budget and all the various uh, little topics that can, can kind of splinter off from there. But first, I want to get to know you a little bit better. So why don't you tell everybody out there how you first became interested in, in economics and how you became a libertarian? Well, uh, it's a uh, – I, I, I actually did an interview on Tom Woods about that and filled – 30 minutes uh, of, uh, of discussion, taking it in four different acts, like Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3, and Act 4. Um, and uh, so I better uh, truncate that. Sure, we can do like the uh, the elevator speech version of that. Okay, <laughs> right. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, I started out uh, at the age of six and seven years old. Uh, the, uh, the, the son of parents who divorced uh, at that age uh, – uh, when uh, then, in fact, that was back in the 1950s when people didn't normally divorce. Uh, my father was a uh, had made a lot of money uh, as a businessman. My mother was a card carrying communist, and uh, and the issues of socialism and capitalism uh, greatly concerned me uh, when I was uh, single digit uh, of single digit age. And that's pretty early. To, yeah. to get involved in that stuff. Yeah, and uh, so I was aware aware of. All of those uh, questions, uh, and uh, I did a detour into wanting to be an actor, playwright, novelist. When uh, I decided to give up on becoming uh, that kind of artist, um, I enrolled in the New School uh, after I graduated from college uh, and studied under mostly actually progressives um, because I wanted to sort out my my uh, my my opinion about socialism and capitalism and then my big uh, eureka moment which i've written up uh, because uh, a collection of uh, murray rothbard's essays uh, called uh, economic controversies includes an introduction by me and the first sentence of that introduction reads it was nearly 40 years ago when murray rothbard changed my life i i picked up a copy of man, economy, and state. At the time, I was teaching economics 
uh, in, uh, in college. I didn't have my PhD yet, but I was getting bored with the subject. And But reading uh, Man, Economy, and State, uh, which is an odd way in, uh, was a revelation to me because it wasn't just, in, if anybody's familiar with that book, that he goes into and discusses the issues of Austrian economics, but he also exposes the fallacies of mainstream economics. So that that's where it started in terms of my intellectual fascination. I realized that I always that, that in a way the term Austrian economic economist is a oxymor is a is a is a is a redundancy, and that we are all Austrians in the sense that we all uh, think about economics in terms of the of individual motivation and incentives in markets, which is the way the Austrians think about it. And indeed, the mainstream economists, when they write about economics, they think in those terms as well. Reading Rothbard and uh, being uh, also being a draft dodger against the Vietnam War, a lot of that came together. And from there, I devoured books uh, from the laissez-faire bookshop in downtown Manhattan uh, and, uh, and became a, a full-blown libertarian uh, by the time I was uh, 30 years old. Was Rothbard's approach really drastically different to you than anything you had seen in your time studying economics, I guess, uh, the proper way in the university? How much did his focus on, say, the, the motivations of the individual, how different from that was that from what you had, had learned prior? Was that something that was totally glossed over in mainstream stream economics? Or was it more just about aggregates and equations and that sort of thing? Well, that's right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the the uh, you, know, you could say aggregates and equations and just statements about demand curves. I mean, just here's a simple example, uh, which uh, I, I think is just important to put your mind around. Uh, the, the idea that 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 when something uh, costs that 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 that, uh, that when there's more of something, we will pay uh, less for it, that, the, that 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 will pay uh, will pay less the more we get of water. Uh, the first, the first few units of water we'll drink because we survive on it. The next few units we'll wash ourselves in. The next few units we'll swim in or we'll clean our clothes in. Uh, and uh, so, so the priorities are we put the first few units of a good to its most urgent use. As in the case of water, we need to we need to drink liquid, so we drink water. The next few units we use it for a, a less urgent use. And so that's that's just an a priori reflection on individual behavior. Uh, and and indeed, there's no amount of, if, if we just cite statistics in the world or draw demand curves or supply curves, nothing can actually prove uh, that law of demand, that the more of, uh, we get of something, the less valuable it is to it. The only thing that can prove it is our a priori understanding of our individual behavior, that unless we're psychotic, um, we'll we'll put the first few units of a good to the most urgent use, and the next few units to the to, to the next most urgent, to the point where, of course, water becomes a bad potentially when it floods our basement. And so that kind of statement uh, w meant so much to me because it meant that we can understand economic behavior by linking it with human action, which is, of course, the title of Ludwig von Mises. A famous work, um, and I believe that when I tell people that there is that we don't really look at statistics to learn things to learn the fundamental economic laws, I use that as an example because I point out that uh, that so that often there's more supply and prices are higher. Well, why is that? Well, obviously that doesn't mean that we abrogate the law of demand. We just understand that there must be some other reason why prices are higher because there's more supply. Maybe there's maybe the money supply is expanded. My point is that that gives you a fun fundamental rootedness in an understanding of economics that only the Austrians convey, even though really, if you read the, 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 the journalistic, journalistic discussions of Milton Friedman or even Paul Samuelson or other mainstream economists, you find that when they're rolling up their sleeves and they're actually thinking about the world and about economics, they too are Austrians without realizing it. Uh, that we are all Austrians in that sense. Uh, we all think in terms of, of, of motivations and incentives in markets. But of course, when they write for the journals, then they use math and, and, and charts and, and graphs and, and, and complicated uh, arithmetical gobbledygook uh, that only confuses matters. So indeed, that's what I learned from the Austrians. But of course, the Austrians also teach us uh, how markets work uh, for the good of all. 
And uh, that also gave me a fundamental understanding uh, that only markets, only the market economy can bring material progress to, uh, to the masses, which, of course, spoke to my communism, spoke to the fact that I am a bleeding heart, that I care about people. And, and, and to care about people, you've got to care about free markets. Well, Gene, let's see if we can uh, apply some of these principles to the present day situation. And uh, we're going to talk a bit today about uh, what you actually referred to in an email as Trump's ugly budget plan. Now, uh, there's a lot in there that the president has been proposing. Uh, for starters, why don't we just hit what to you are, are some of the most egregious aspects of the proposed Trump budget? Well, uh, I, 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 uh, I think it re I can really be very brief by talking uh, about what's egregious. Uh, what's egregious uh, is, that the, uh, the, is that Trump ran for office by intoning the following statement, waste, fraud, and abuse. Everywhere you look in the federal budget, there's waste, fraud and abuse. And, uh, and I, I, I will cut so much, he said, it will make your head spin. Uh, that's what he kept saying. Uh, and, uh, I, but what he's done, however, is that he, he, and the waste, fraud and abuse article, uh, statement, by the way, inspired me to do a major article for Barron's in which I went for the low hanging fruit in, 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 in the 10 year budget projection of the Congressional Budget Office. And I found that you could cut about eight and a half trillion dollars from, from the spending side of the budget and, and that you could balance the budget within 10 years uh, without raising taxes. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the. When you say you could cut that much out, what, what exactly would you be cutting out in that Oh, scenario? well, I mean, you, 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 you didn't well, start, start, start with the military since. Uh, that often is portrayed as you know as kind of innocent. You know, we we spend That's the untouchable aspect that they always yeah, kind of yeah. refer to it as. Yes, um, we. I mean, we we, we uh, without. Well, of course, where, where this where this made a difference, I guess, in terms of ideology was uh, I is was was that we really don't have to have a military base protecting the Germans against an invasion by the Russians. We don't right. really have to have. Uh, military bases uh, protecting uh, Japan, military base on Okinawa. Uh, we can really tell these countries that that they, that they can defend themselves if they do have a problem. And so uh, clearly, if you if you started to cut back just on the military bases we have all around the world, uh, then you could save a huge. I, I forget the, the amount of money I would I was able to save just from the military budget was nearly a trillion dollars. What I'm trying to emphasize, though, that since this was written for barons. A relatively, you know, a free market oriented, but not really radical libertarian <laughs> publication. Uh, I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to the extreme uh, by by cutting eight and a half trillion dollars. I, I was only pointing out that you could be kind of a reformer of the budget. You could recognize that our military expenditures, are, some of them are, are wasteful and unnecessary, and and you could cut that way. Uh, that you could pare back. You could address Medicare fraud. You could all of that was really just a reformist budget, which really was not my kind of budget. Um, I would shut. I, I believe I'm trying to remember. I guess I said that that we could basically shut down the Department of Education because we didn't used to have it. There's no absolutely the, the founding fathers would roll over in their grave to think that we that we have such a such a department. Uh, we could shut down. We could cut back on 48 million people having food stamps when, in fact, you know, there's no real hunger in America. So pruning here, pruning there, go, you could cut eight and a half trillion and you could have a balanced budget. But uh, my point is that it could be done. But what what Trump has done, I, I want I don't want to especially go near the issue of his cutting taxes. I do believe, by the way, that cutting the corporate income tax was a good idea for reasons probably that that you had guests discuss before the, the corp. We, we've had the U.S. has had a very uncompetitive corporate income tax. Um, and it's just putting us more or less in parity with the rest of the world. I would have no corporate income tax at all, by the way. I would abolish it altogether. But the corporate income, income tax is revenue neutral. But my only hesitation with respect to the other tax cuts on, 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 on income tax is that is that I would ra I would ra like to wanted to see a cut in spending before I saw a cut in taxes. But I, I respect my libertarian friends who say, look, if you can cut taxes, do it whenever you can, and then get to the spending side. But obviously, what Trump is doing 
is is basically basically deciding that he's going to be in the same tra- tradition uh, that 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 started with George W. Bush, that continued with Obama, and that is con- continuing uh, with him. Uh, that 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 he's essentially indifferent. Uh, to the uh, to, to the fiscal time bomb uh, that is going to explode in about ten to fifteen to twenty years. Uh, that essentially he's not concerned with the the warnings of the non of the of the, non, of the uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office that warns uh, that keeps warning that there could be a major fiscal crisis uh, resulting from uh, the ballooning debt. And so he's he's abrogated that responsibility. Ironically, ironically, the last fiscal conservative we had, although I don't give him a whole lot of credit for it, was Bill Clinton. Uh, the I, I believe that Clinton saw the opportunity to sound like a fiscal conservative because, as perhaps you know, the history that uh, that that he had a a, a a a number of lucky accidents. Hillary Care, which was the earlier version of, of Obamacare, failed. So that explosion of the budget never happened, uh, and then the, the the Cold War had ended, and uh, in uh, in, eight, in 1989, 1990. So there was a certain amount of closing of bases. The military budget fell, and then on top of that, by 1994, the Republicans controlled both houses of Congress and and put a put a lock. And Newt Gingrich came in and put a lock on his spending, and so we were making progress. But then George W. Bush came in, Obama came in, and now. Um, now, now a uh, uh, Trump and the warnings of the Congressional Budget Office, uh, the the former director of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, Douglas Holtz Eakin, no longer talks like a bureaucrat. He said in 2011, after he had left the CBO, the federal government's budget is on the road to hell. And he then elaborated, there is no polite way to describe why the largest economy has placed itself on a trajectory that looks like a third world debt crisis. We are on the road to hell. Uh, and there's, I guess, I think there are opportunities for that crisis for, for libertarians. I, I'm a kind of a conservative libertarian. I don't like to see crisis and suffering uh, in order to, to get, uh, get progress in the world. But I do see an opportunity uh, for us when the uh, federal budget goes to 150 percent, 160 percent, 170 percent of GDP. I believe that's going to bring a fiscal crisis uh, for which there may be an opportunity. The opportunity may be that we'll, we'll finally turn to Bitcoin for our currency. That's, that's what I think could happen uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years from now when, uh, when that fiscal crisis hits. Well, you know things are bad when even uh, people within the government agencies are actually saying that there's a problem coming up here. Uh, let's talk more about the fiscal time bomb, as you refer to it, and how you actually see that playing out. Because I have, uh, you know, as we discussed before the show, I live out here in Los Angeles. I have many progressive friends. Uh, they seem, it's, it's interesting, because at one time under Obama, they seemed to have no problem with increased spending. Um, at, the other, at the other end, they seem to actually think, for some reason, that uh, Donald Trump is drastically cutting a bunch of things that they, that they uh, cherish in the government. Government. But uh, can you just actually first clear up this idea of, of cuts? Because often we hear about cuts that are coming up, but in reality, the cuts that we hear about, they're only cuts to previously proposed increases. So no matter what we're talking about, we're always talking about increases in the budget, increases for every program. Can you address that for a second? Oh, yes. Well, you you, you explained it. I mean, I, I've used I, – I mean, I, 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 uh, in one of the columns I wrote about this, I used the example you have a profligate relative – uh, who's uh, who refuses to save for his retirement? He's constantly in mm-hmm. debt, and uh, and what he does is uh, he he tells you uh, that uh, you know, that he, that he's cut he's cut his cut his, his spending, and indeed, as you say, you find out that when he cuts his spending, it's just that uh, his plans to take an expensive trip abroad are being pared down, and he's going to take a somewhat less expensive trip abroad. It only means that. <laughs> That instead of increasing his spending by uh, by ten percent, he's going to increase it by seven percent. So there's that painful three percentage point. He's just going to Mexico instead of Paris. Basically. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, or you you know, you, you you're not going to gain twenty pounds. You only gain fifteen. I mean, <laughs> so we can we can do variations on that endlessly. And indeed, and it's and it's only only in the government 
You know, can we talk in some such such crazy terms? Again, if you had a profligate relative uh, like that, then uh, you'd you'd of course regard him as totally irresponsible. Uh, there are such people, but most most households, uh, at least, they can't possibly tell you in a straight face that they're cutting spending because they know because they're going to pare back on 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 the increases. Um, only only governments talk like that, and in, and of course you're right. Uh, the, the, amazingly, the media do uh, often write up those uh, the, the, those slow uh, those decelerations in growth of spending as though they are cuts. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, Trump has completely, really, in broad brushstrokes, with with the expansion of the military, where we, where we, yeah, I thought it was possible that he wouldn't do that. Uh, he's abrogated. Again, all and has, as have the Republicans, uh, all all responsibility for what's been happening. And as you indicate, uh, you you really do have to worry when an agency of government in government keeps warning uh, of a fiscal crisis. Here's an interesting story. When I first one of the articles I wrote up, I, I, I it said on the cover uh, that uh, we were going that we were potentially going the way of Greece. And uh, Paul Krugman. Whom you may be familiar with, uh, actually a bit. wrote a blog about that irresponsible cover on Barron's. You know, the, the right wing nuts at Barron's are uh, saying that, that we could go the way of Greece. So I responded in, a, in my own blog by saying, you know, the, that analogy going the way with Greece, that didn't originate with me. It originated with the nonpartisan conservative Congressional Budget Office. They, they wrote, uh, they published a 2010 paper about the looming fiscal crisis, which is which, which pretty much has ne have never been updated, pretty much stands. Every time the Congressional Budget Office uh, updates their, their projections going out 10, 20, 30, 40 years, they constantly reference that paper. And that in that paper, uh, the, the, the analogy was drawn with Greece. Obviously, there are differences uh, and there are similarities uh, with Greece. And so that's scary analogy, uh, again, came from government, from, from, from the Congressional Budget Office. I mean, the, the, the scenario to get to, to the question that, that you ask about, about what is the likely trajectory, uh, diff difficult to say when the crisis will hit. And the Congressional Budget Office, understandably, uh, only talks about possibil possibilities about when and how. Uh, but we certainly can talk about Various ways in which it can hit, but uh, th th we do know now that 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 it that it's a, that it, a lot of it has to do with demographics. Uh, more than half the baby boomers have not yet retired, so we 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 do have the calm before the storm. the 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 baby boomer retirees have not yet hit critical mass. The youngest baby boomers boomers are still now fifty four, turning fifty four years old this year. And so there are a number of years away from, from Medicare at 65, uh, depending on when they take Social Security. Uh, we don't know. But, so, but we do know that, that, uh, that, that more than half of them are not yet. Uh, the oldest baby boomers are 72. So they are fully blown uh, elder care recipients. But we, do, we, we can certainly say that, that, it's, that, it's, that the, the critical mass of, of, of the baby boomer retirees will not really happen for another 10 years. When, when virtually 10 years from now, virtually all the baby boomers are going to be uh, are, are, are going to be receiving Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, all of those things that are the explosive part of the budget. So in that sense, we do have some time if we had rational people in government, some time to turn this around. That's the big uh, if. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That is the big if. Yes. But, but clearly, if, if the Republican controlled Congress is not doing anything about it and only looking and sounding exactly like they're all uh, they're all disciples of, of Obama or indeed of George W. Bush, uh, who was also a Republican, but also a big spender, uh, then I think there's little hope. If Trump, who could talk about waste, fraud and abuse, is doing virtually nothing about the waste, fraud, and abuse, then there's very little hope uh, that anything uh, short of a miracle could happen, that any initiative is going to be taken by government. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the point, of course, that the Congressional Budget Office makes is that if you really are running a responsible government, then you can't just blindside 
people. You know, you can end you can end welfare as we know it for 25 and 30 year olds. They can make an adjustment, but you can't if you get people uh, uh, in their 70s who are, who are look who are looking forward to all the protection, all the entitlement programs of government. You can't suddenly tell a bunch of 70, 75 year olds you got to do something different. You can't suddenly pull the plug on them. So that's why uh, planning ahead and prudence uh, is required now, and none of that is happening. And so that's why it looks as though almost definitely the trajectory is going to continue. I can see odd possibilities. There is some nascent moves to, to move toward a, a, a freer market in, in medical care because the deductibles have gotten, gotten so big. Maybe, the, maybe something will happen there. But it, it, it is amazing to say it, to some that, that that the congressional budget office can talk about a trajectory a trajectory going out 15 20 25 years you know we can't you know we have difficulty predicting you know the weather so how can we predict this this disaster in the making well the reason we can by, is by is that by and large we we're, we're, first we're, we're extrapolating the, the fact that medical care per capita or cost always seems to go up we're, we're extrapolating uh, the, the the demographics which which are pretty much baked in the cake. And and when you do those calculations and you assume, make normal assumptions for all other spending, you get a, a federal debt that's, that we know is growing every year that now is about 76, 77, 78 percent of gross domestic product. And the trajectory is that it could easily rise to 150 percent and then from 150 percent continue to go up from there. And now that's now we, we, we always can expect the unexpected. But but we do, but we do know that 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 there's a very strong likelihood that 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 the that the growth in the debt is going to continue. We do know that given what Trump has done, cutting taxes and increasing spending, that it, it, that we may even get there sooner than the Congressional Budget Office projects than than than, than later. And uh, and we do know that if you're actually running a government and you're responsible for entitlement programs to the elderly, this is. Not a way to plan. This is not not a way uh, to run things. You 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 have to anticipate problems, and when there's a likely problem, you you have to start acting, especially when you're dealing with old people. So that's why I say there's an 80 to 90 to 95 percent chance that 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 the crisis that the Congressional Budget Office is predict, predicting is going to happen, and uh, and it, it 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 and when will it happen? As I say. Uh, it depends upon when the debt markets, when when the when, uh, uh, both domestically and internationally begin to get scared, begin to wonder uh, at 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 what's going on. The 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 we do have, as you also know, a a situation in which the interest rate is so low that that the debt servicing costs are not that high. But 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 all you have to do is assume a return to interest rates that aren't even similar to the average interest rate uh, on servicing the debt and you get a frightening number so we we have a lot of storm clouds arising my name is dale kearns and i'm running for the united states senate in pennsylvania as a libertarian i'm a concerned citizen who has had enough i work as a project manager for an electrical contractor in southeastern pennsylvania there I manage large commercial and industrial projects. I'm a husband and a father of two energetic little girls. I'm running to advocate for a society where my girls have more liberty, not less. Will you support our campaign? Unlike my competitors, I'm not a career politician. I don't have millionaire and billionaire donors. I'm running for Senate in Pennsylvania because I want to take the message to Washington that we want government out of our lives. Will you let me be your voice? Let me be the voice that says, we will not walk quietly down the road to serfdom. The voice that says we need free market solutions. The voice that says we need to end the failed war on drugs. The voice who will fight for the forgotten man, non-violent offenders wasting away in prison, and addicts who are afraid to speak up and seek the help they need. We are seeking members for our campaign team. I encourage you to apply. We need donations to help us spread the message of liberty across the state. We can go on hoping for liberty to happen, or we can fight together. I hope you choose the latter and join me today. Find out more at DaleKearns.com. Paid for by Dale Kearns for Office. So, Gene, if you don't mind, I just want to um, 
kind of talk a little bit about how like so this is a very difficult issue to to discuss with people again especially out here in California where they just think that the, the government money will come forever and ever but you know on, on one side like the libertarian in me knows that these programs need to be addressed uh, they're they're not working correctly uh, in, or in, in some ways they are for some people that are on them but ultimately as you've discussed they are destined to implode yeah. uh, at the same time that the bleeding heart in me I kind of like yourself I don't want to kick uh, you know grandma and grandpa onto the street when they're 75 years old and have no alternative so you know when you're we're discussing this with maybe someone my age someone in their 30s or 40s what how what can you tell them about how this debt will absolutely impact their lives um, in the coming decades I mean what are going to be the real world Im- implications of hitting that fiscal time bomb well I, I think I think that there will be a, a, a very uh, the, the worst I can say is that uh, is that for people who are 65 70 75 it will be they, they, there will be a, a reaction on the part of the Medicare program uh, to make it more and more difficult for them to collect on uh, on, on on the on the payments uh, that the, the the depressing part of it is that the, 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 the typically typically we have a government that supposedly cares most about people of limited means uh, but uh, what will happen is that people of limited means who are very dependent on Medicare are probably going to get hurt. They'll probably find that that the care, the medical care that they can get is going to become more and more difficult to get. It'll be more and more difficult to get it paid for. And so there will be a deterioration in that sense. Although, by the way, I will say that 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 the that Medicare is already uh, uh, filled with all kinds of problems. It all it already preys on poor people. So I don't I don't think Medicare is such a, a, a terrific deal. I mean the, the the sickness of medical Medicare is that again it's a third party payment sickness. The third party payment sickness is that again uh, you're contracting with a doctor and and neither of you basically pay for the service the third party pays for for government so you're not so you're not really shopping around you don't care about price but more more especially the, the medical industry since it since it's paid by government invents all kinds of procedures for you and convinces you that you need all kinds of medical procedures that might do you harm uh, but since they don't they don't cost you anything and since they can help themselves to government money when they, when they impose them on you uh, then uh, then then uh, those procedures happen and so uh, to to the extent I, I you know if somebody were to tell me that he's going to look into whether whether the medicare system actually hurts and kills as much as it helps and then I would say, look, you know, that's worth exploring. We don't really know. I mean, Dave, I don't know if you know about the a guy named David Goldhill, who, who I think has been a great voice in this in this uh, in, in the free market. He wrote, he published an article in the Atlantic called "How the How American Healthcare Killed My Father," and he, he looked into this. He talked. He 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 began to expose all the ways in which the Medicare system actually preys on people. So, well, that's, that, that, that's by the way, so that, that I, I just want to make the point that there's a lot of nuance in this story. But, right. but I, do think, I do think, though, that when you ask me the question, where is it headed if, if, the, if Medicare is going to start busting the budget, uh, and it's going to become unsustainable. Then there's just all kinds of way. I mean, I, I guess the worst case, it, 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 uh, perhaps your listeners know about the story of the of the VA, the Veterans Administration. That the Veterans Administration uh, was the darling of the Paul Krugmans of this world. It was written about as the ideal government, completely government-run medical program. And then, as you know. Three, four years ago, the scandals started to hit. Now, they weren't servicing people. They, they, they were falsifying records. They were putting people on, on, on harmful drug regimens rather than to uh, allow them into the hospital. And, and so the destructiveness and evil of the VA system has been exposed, and partly because they're they, a swollen bureaucracy, spending money without any kind, kind of rules of efficiency, and, and then running out of resources and then essentially finagling the books and not servicing people. So that kind of unfortunate uh, disaster uh, is something that I can't rule out for the Medicare system to the extent that it does any good at all. And so that could happen. So, of course, I, I would tell, of course, people who are um, under the age of, uh, of, of 40, under the age of 50, that you should think in terms of providing for yourself 
with respect to medical care rather than relying on the Medicare system to the extent that you can afford to do so. I mean, people of this age might even need to start planning to, you know, take care of their parents who might become victims of this situation as well. Exactly, exactly. But, 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 but of course, the point, perhaps your audience is, is, is well healed and God, I'm, I'm happy that they are, happy for them that they are. But of course, it, it typically, because what happens is that government programs that are supposed to be for people, uh, help people of lim limited means, uh, and I end up just leading them down the garden path. I mean, ultimately, of course, ultimately, the whole idea we, that, 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 that the government should have anything to do with medical care was a mistake. From the start, the entire Western economies have been marching in the wrong direction. It never made any sense at all to think that government should have anything to do with the provision of medical care. And I do have some hope, by the way, uh, that the, that there that there are there is in this country a kind of a nascent move to to bring alive uh, marketable medical care. A lot of some of the some of your fellow podcasters have interviewed some of these people, and I know a, a number of them who actually. Thinking in terms, you know, perhaps about the initiative recently taken by Amazon uh, in conjunction with uh, was it Citibank and uh, and uh, and Warren Buffett's uh, Berkshire Hathaway to try to try to actually bring more marketable solutions to medical care. I'm hopeful for, about that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether it will make much difference. Uh, yeah, I mean, only if say the Amazons and the I mean the CVSs of of the world, these these major companies can come together and either innovate new methods or new methods of delivering you know medical care. Perhaps that can cut costs so so much that uh, you know it won't be as tragic when this this time bomb sort of explodes. Maybe that's just the best we can hope for based on uh, the fact that it doesn't seem like we're getting those rational politicians that you hope for. And uh, speaking of Gene, I mean, I, I got to say, you mentioned if if only we had these rational politicians in office, uh, someone like yourself who seems to really have a grasp on these issues and really seems to understand the impact have you ever considered uh, running for office and trying to actually uh, enact some of your ideas here well um, ever since uh, some of the young people in my life noticed that uh, that I not only uh, somewhat resemble Bernie Bernie uh, <laughs> but why do I forget Bernie Sanders uh, that I, I, I often gesture like him. They said, my God, you're the libertarians and said to Bernie Sanders, you'll be an easy win. And so <laughs> I've been tempted ever since people have told me that, but I, but I think I'm, I'm probably just sort of too blunt a person to ever make it as a politician. I mean, Donald Trump was pretty blunt. You got, you got to say of all, all things I, about him. <laughs> you're, no, you're right. You're right. You know, you might this, could work for you. <laughs> look at the end of this interview. I may, you, I may really roar and say, you know, my hat in the ring. <laughs> this might be the, the, the start of the draft of Gene Epstein movement. We'll this see. This could be you. This could start, it started this interview that uh, <laughs> that's happening. But, but the, the, the main, the main point to bear in mind about, about the fiscal crisis is uh, that, uh, that you know, uh, interestingly, the difference between us and Greece is, is that Greece Greece had to pay its debt in euros, and and the Krugmans of this world point out that we we don't ever really have to have to worry because all our debt is denominated in our own currency in dollars. Uh, so so what? So will we re will will we really ever have to default on our debt? And the answer is, technically, we won't because indeed we have the power to print dollars. So we can always pay, the U.S. can always pay its treasury debt, you know, half of which, by the way, the other key point to know is that half of the treasury debt uh, is held by foreigners, a lot of it by the Chinese, a lot of it by the Japanese. A, a, great, a great quip uh, was uh, issued from, uh, forgetting the guy's name, but he's actually mainstream. He said they, they should tell, tell our government that if we ever actually have to defend Taiwan against the Chinese, we'll have to do it on money we borrow from the Chinese. You know, that, that's, that's part, that, that, that actually is a heartening fact that in a way that, that, that they are uh, one of, now one of our principal creditors. So they sort of care. I think that brings countries together. It makes, makes a war with the Chinese less likely. Uh, that, I mean, we probably can't pay you back if we go to war together. So exactly. yeah. <laughs> we can't pay you back if we go to war together. And besides, please lend us money so that we can go to war with you. So <laughs> right. we're in a box. And I think that's that's sort of a happy irony. But the point, though, is that that if we if we if we do print as we as we inevitably will, by the way, I, I, I'm exaggerating. I say inevitably. There will, nothing's inevitable. We Austrians know that you can't. Nothing's a lead pipe cinch. But but if the if if, if our treasury debt 
balloons to 150 percent, 160 percent of our GDP. If the interest rate rises, if the cost of servicing the debt becomes enormous, then there could be a real spike in interest rates because there will be some, you know, and and the spike, by the way, could be just the very fear that 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 our Federal Reserve is going to is going to pursue a very very inflationist money printing policy. Because again, that, there's no free lunch when you start printing money. There could be a Dow dollar death spiral. The the, the the dollar could begin to decline when we start inflating our money supply in order to pay our debts. Uh, the uh, investors from abroad could start pulling out of the stock market. The, our, our currency could fall further. Uh, the, my, my only point is that, amazingly, when when the Krugmans of this world and others say, what to what is there to worry about? Our, our debt is denominated in dollars and we are in charge of our own currency. I say, well, that that could just pour gasoline on the fire. That, that, that could be the major response. Print money and cause, cause, cause inflation, cause a declining dollar. And that will be the form in which our fiscal crisis takes. That convenience might might end up being our, our ultimate downfall in because the end. Uh, because it's, it's tempting. The power to print money is tempting on the part of government. Yeah, Gene, well, it's certainly a lot to chew on. Uh, one thing I want to touch before we let you go here, touch on, is uh, something that you do, again, as we mentioned at the top of the show, you uh, you run and also I believe you moderate a lot of these debates over at the Soho Forum in New York City. I believe you put them on uh, about every month or so. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit more about what you do there and uh, maybe give us a preview of some of the interesting debates you've got coming up. Well, thanks very much uh, for allowing me to, to plug it. Uh, the one thing for those in California to know is that uh, we we do, do do live streaming and by the way if you go to uh, the soho forum dot org that's continuous the soho forum dot org you'll find uh, the, uh, the 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 audios and videos of all the debates we've held I usually do one debate a year I, I did a debate with uh, Yaron Brook by the way of Ayn Rand Institute on whether selfishness was or was not a virtue. We do Oxford style voting. You vote before and after the debate um, and whoever moves the needle uh, wins the Tootsie Roll. Uh, our next, uh, and, uh, and I started the debate series because I thought it was uh, really good to join with, against, pro with, with progressives and debate issues that progressives want to debate uh, with us. Uh, I thought that while there's some great lecture series in New York um, and there's some great podcasts, yours included, lots of great stuff out there. I thought that while you have had debates, of course, um, and uh, and Tom does debates, I thought a one-on-one -on -one theatrical one-on-one -on -one debate every month uh, of a t with a topic of, uh, debating a topic of interest, interest to libertarians would be a good institution to run. We we now we, we we've gotten a great response. We we have a theater that fill, fill that uh, that uh, seats about 200 people, and we generally sell out to capacity at $18 a ticket, $10 for students. We go live streaming. So that our debates start at at six at six forty five, uh, usually Monday evenings once a month. So that of course you'd have at it's three forty five in California if you want to watch us on live streaming and you can send in questions which we which we're we, just rolling out of bed at that time out here. So at that's perfect. Five in the afternoon. <laughs> okay, fine. So it's a good morning. Have it with your morning coffee. That's before <laughs> five in the afternoon. Uh, but of course you can watch it on 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 uh, video. And uh, and tech. and of course, you have a huge audience. No doubt, a lot of people listening in the New York City area. So do come to the Soho Forum dot org. Eighteen dollars a ticket. Monday, uh, March nineteenth, uh, we're going to debate the following resolution: There is a rape culture on college campuses that creates an unsafe environment for female students. Uh, defending the resolution will be sociology professor. Michael Kimmel and uh, uh, negating, taking the negative on the resolution will be journalist Kathy Young, author of The Injustice of the Rape Culture Theory. Um, and so uh, we, we range all over the map from social issues to economic issues to free market issues. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, if you're in New York, uh, uh, then uh, do please come. Uh, if, uh, if you're in California, do please watch us. On, uh, on live streaming. And in any case, you can certainly watch our debates on, on video and on audio. We are, we are, we've been acquired by the Reason People, Reason Foundation. They, they run us, they help us, and they also uh, uh, they, they publish our podcasts. 
Very cool. Well, be sure to check out uh, the Soho Forum. I'll, of course, link to that and a bunch of your other work over in the show notes for today's program. Gene, it has been a pleasure. And, guys, if you, uh, if you, know, if you liked what you heard from Gene and uh, we got your, you thinking a little bit here, maybe get that hashtag going, draft Gene Epstein. We'll see where it goes. We'll do. <laughs> Gene, thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk again soon. Let's do it again sometime. Bye-bye. All right, chillin'. I hope you enjoyed my conversation there with Gene Epstein, a really enjoyable guy to talk to about a subject that, I mean, often to the uh, the common man isn't the sexiest subject in the world of the United States debt, but it's one that's going to affect each and every one of our lives, at least uh, U.S. citizens. I would argue everyone around the world will be greatly affected by the U.S. debt crisis when it really does hit that breaking point in whatever form it may be. It's going to have worldwide ramifications. So this is something that's very important to discuss. And boy, I couldn't think of anybody more informed on the topic than Gene Epstein. And I'm serious. I'm serious about this hashtag. We need people that are knowledgeable about the real problems at the highest levels of government. Let's draft Gene Epstein. Hashtag draft Gene Epstein. Why not? Let's see where this thing goes. But, you know, besides uh, focusing your activist efforts on Gene Epstein, I'd love you to also focus some of that energy, some of that liberty fire right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast by joining the Lions of Liberty Pride because we really offer you a ton of content on the latest League of Liberty podcast. Actually, uh, we were praised by our good friend Roger Paxton, host of the Lava Flow podcast. For those of you that are new that might not know what the League of Liberty is, it is a little conglomerate of Liberty podcasts that consists of myself and my friends here at Lions of Liberty as well as Roger Paxton of the Lava Flow podcast, Johnny Rocket Adams, of the Johnny Rocket Launchpad, as well as Chris Spangle of We Are Libertarians. We have formed a sort of super group of sorts to help support each other. You'll often hear uh, our ads on each other's shows, promoting each other's work. We'll mention each other often when talking about other libertarian podcasts because we believe in the general mission that uh, we are all on together to spread the ideas of liberty in new and interesting ways. And uh, we also record a podcast together called the League of Liberty Podcast. Now, that show is only available to either members of the Lions of Liberty Pride, our pay group, or people who support the Lava Flow podcast, or We Are Libertarians on Patreon, or members of Johnny Rocket Launchpad's Backstage Pass. If you're a member of any of those groups, you will get access to the League of Liberty podcast. We had a great time on the last show. Uh, a little bit of the, uh, we called it the Fallout Edition after Roger and Chris had a bit of a controversial spat on the last episode. But, you know, Roger went off and praised the Lions of Liberty Pride for, he said, we provide the most content, the most content other than one non-libertarian podcast that he mentioned um, when it comes to the value you get for the money you contribute. Because, for as little as $5 a month, you get access to all of our exclusive audio. We do all sorts of bonus shows. Uh, you know, Brian, Rico, and Odie do the Degenerate Gamblers podcast where they talk about, well, in theory, they talk about gambling and, and that sort of thing. But really, they end up talking about all sorts of things, including a lot of uh, old drinking stories from our college days. You know, uh, we've all known each other for uh, 15 to 20 years, and uh, there's a lot of stories in there. So you can hear a lot of that inside stuff by listening to a lot of the bonus shows we do. We do extra podcasts when we do Libertarians in Living Rooms Drinking Liquor, as we will be doing with Roger Paxton next week. We also do Conspiracy Corner, our deep dive into all sorts of conspiracy theories, uh, ranging from the wacky and wild like the Flat Earth to uh, you know things like Waco, Oklahoma City bombing we're going to be doing pretty soon. We've talked about 9-11. We really uh, are not afraid to touch any subjects, and the pe members of the Lions of Liberty Pride really guide that content. We have a secret Facebook group that only Pride members have access to, and they get to provide questions directly for our guests. We'll often do bonus segments with some of our big guests like Tom Woods, Scott Horton, Dave Smith, Julie Borowski. You get access to all of this stuff for as little as $5 a month. And it's not just for the heck of it. It's not to make us rich, trust me. Uh, we're not taking a dime out of this fund. This is a completely segregated account that we only use for things related to this podcast, uh, whether it's equipment upgrades or, in this case, we are vastly approaching our $1,000 a month goal to send us to Porkfest to record some live podcasts and uh, become more immersed in the Liberty community to meet Roger Paxton in person. Uh, we're hoping to get Johnny Rocket Adams. In fact, Johnny confirmed that 
he bought his tickets to Porkfest. So we're going to get Johnny there as well, and we're hoping to get Chris Spengel, if we are libertarians out there, to actually record a live edition, not only of the League of Liberty podcast, but we're also looking to record a live edition of Libertarians in Living Rooms Drinking Liquor. We are so close to this goal. You can join by heading over to lionsofliberty.com slash support. Of course, we have higher levels. For 10 bucks a month, you get an extra t-shirt and one of our beer koozies. For 15 bucks a month, you get all of that in addition to access to Howie Snowden's daily news links, which is basically where we get all of our knowledge about the goings-on in the world. Not only things related to libertarianism directly, but just a lot of current events and that sort of thing. Uh, people are really, really digging that bonus feature. I mean, you don't need to search the internet for news at all. Howie is literally a professional literally a professional, I will say it again, at information gathering. So uh, you've got him at your disposal when you hit that $15 level. Of course, when you get to the $25 level, you not only get everything you get at the other levels, you also get to hop on a monthly conference call with us and really directly influence the show uh, in that way. And of course, our, our, our fans are really enjoying that kind of personal interaction that you get from being at really any level of the Pride. You get to interact with us a lot more as well as help us grow this program, put money into advertisements as we did at the end of last year and hopefully soon go to Porkfest and get you some uh, some great new podcasts some, from live on the scene. Of course, we'll we'll be on Facebook, we'll be on social media, we'll be doing live streams and that sort of thing. And you know, the more support we get, the more of that kind of event we can go to. So again, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash support for as little as five bucks a month. That's just one beer, one coffee, one latte. You will got to give up to give us some support to what is hopefully one of your favorite libertarian podcasts of all time. So thank you once again for tuning in. Don't forget to hit up today's show notes where I'll have some links to some of the work Gene Epstein has done on the topics we discussed today over at lionsofliberty.com slash 337. And don't forget to tune in this coming Wednesday when my man Brian McWilliams brings you his weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty with Electric Liberty Land. And John Odermatt, of course, wraps things up this coming Friday with his weekly look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. Until next time, folks, live long and live free. Hey guys, this is Roger Paxton, and if you're fed up with the government running every single aspect of your life, but you're not listening to the Lava Flow podcast yet, then what's wrong with you? Check us out at thelavaflow.com, or just go back to sucking up to the government. The Lava Flow podcast, striking the root every single episode. This is Chris Spangle, and I am the host of We Are Libertarians, which you can find in iTunes, Google Play, or at wearelibertarians.com. We are a podcast that brings you all of the irreverence that modern politics deserves by examining current events from a libertarian perspective. So please, check us out at wearelibertarians.com. Hey everyone, the Johnny Rocket Launchpad is Liberty. Each week we strive to bring you the best guests in talk radio. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad delivers weekly interviews of noteworthy politicians, experts, and activists. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad is bringing the party to the Libertarian Party and launching ideas in your direction. Check us out at johnnyrocketlaunchpad.com. You can hear me, Kurt Nelson, and the beautiful Heather Nixon talk about the ideas of liberty, rock and roll. Don't be a bullet in the 619.